Uh, maybe next, next slide. Okay. Uh, so, a little bit about me. I work at Manchester Business School and um, that's where I teach and I do research about information systems and business. Uh, if by the end of this talk you would be interested to have a look and see what I've been doing in terms of research, you can see the university website or I'm in ResearchGate and I also maintain an active Twitter account. Uh, so, just broadly I want to give you a background about what is my research about. I do research on two big areas. First of all is that I'm interested about the human and social aspects of software development. I look at how teams collaborate to get together and how diversity exists in software industry. The next part of my research is about um, online activism. I'm very enthusiastic to understand how online um, activism works, how it's emerged and how it progress over time. So this basically constitutes my big area of research. Uh, uh, today's session, uh, I'm not going to really go further in detail about my research, but I'm going to uh, introduce a method called adaptive comparative causal mapping that emerged through my research um, about software development teams. Uh, I craft my message about this presentation in three stories. First, how did this method emerge? Uh, how it helped us? And in fact, what is the promise that it offers to you and future researchers? And the third story, how is actually going to work and how you can go home and start using this method in your research? So the first story is the emergence of the method. So uh, next slide, please, thanks. Have you ever been interested in understanding the similarities and differences between similar phenomena, things that they look the same, but they might have some differences or also maybe some similarities? Well, actually, especially when about things like how people think about the same phenomena or how they experience the same thing. The, um, Andrew, before me, he talked about the experiences that people have about the city. For example, like how different experiences of the students or how similar they could be, for example, to the lectures and so on. Well, actually, I was. I used to work in um, a number of software projects and my work was basically about sitting in different challenging teams and trying to listen to different stakeholders. And it was very fascinating for me coming to this observation that um, we could see that different stakeholders, they had different perceptions about what is the problem that is emerging or is unfolding in that uh, project. And it was especially very impressive and sometimes actually sad that their perceptions was resulting in contradictory actions. So for example, like I was sitting with clients, they had an opinion about what is the problem in this project. And the project manager had a different opinion, developer had different opinion, and it was kind of, I felt sympathetic at times because um, they were trying to resolve the problems by doing actions that from the perspective of another stakeholder could actually add to the problem. So I started asking these questions that uh, how do key stakeholders in those projects, and that context was agile software development, how do they see barriers to effective knowledge sharing? And obviously, in, in some contexts especially, knowledge sharing is very important. Agile software development is one of them because it has stakeholders from variety of fields, um, not just development teams that they are product owners and project managers, but also the clients were coming. Like this software was being produced for archaeologists or for um, hospitals and nurses who were involved or also for like architects. Uh, so you, you could see a variety of different perspectives that were coming on board to develop a software and they had variety of you know different perspectives and this would uh, escalate and resolve basically lead to problems that um, are not quite uh, what we were hoping to have. So uh, I started this project, I uh, started working on that with my co-author Lars Matthiasen in Atlanta and we framed this research question and as a first step I started looking at the literature to see are there 
studies who are saying that what are the problems, what are these similarities and dif differences between different stakeholders. Well, the result was that no, previously nobody has done that. Uh, then the second step was that we look at the literature to see how do existing researchers study different perspectives that people may have. Uh, the thing was that we found a method gap that basically extend literature suggests that there are not really um, systematic methods for understanding and exploring these differences or similarities. Uh, so one of the, during this literature review, I came up with this, um, found this method, comparative causal mapping. That sounds actually very promising because it was giving some um, interesting insights about maps, constructs, uh, maybe we can interview with different people who are involved in that project and trying to reveal their mindset, their con cognitive thinking by drawing the uh, constructs of their maps and then trying to compare these maps together, which sound actually good. Uh, but uh, remember, there was a limited understanding of the topic, which was agile software development. Plus, there was, uh, there was also uh, a problem with the gap. In fact, methodological discussions on CCM were very rare. So the paper that, were talk that was talking about CCM was, had interesting ideas, but there was no methodological guidelines about how these measures that the CCM was saying should be measured, or what are the exact procedures for that. And also, there were not quite a lot of examples to see how different researchers have done. And this uh, basically resulted in us thinking that, okay, we can uh, start to do some sampling in a number of software companies and a number of software projects and develop a grounded understanding that help us develop these causal maps and reveal what are different perceptions or similar perceptions that different role in these types of projects have. Uh, and what Basically, what I'm going to say, the message of my today talk, is that it was through this reflective conversation between method and research data, which was quite in-depth, and uh, a lot of that was actually interview data, that a new method emerged, adaptive comparative causal mapping. So I want to say that it is possible that we also contribute a new method based on um, interacting with what exists and also in-depth data and being flexible with that. So I'm going uh, through each of these um, as, we, as I walk you through my research. So this adaptive, uh, adaptive CCM is based on the existing CCM, but what is actually expanding the model is that it a lot focus on analysis sec section, which actually we are talking about comparative causal mapping, which is all the result is coming through the analysis. And the analysis, were, the analysis section, because they were not quite obvious and clear, so um, we developed this, um, mod this framework and this method for uh, studying different perceptions by uh, suggesting, especially changing the method uh, in these areas, creating and using vocabularies, processing data for causal maps, constructing them, and especially analysis of maps, which is a big contribution of this method and this study. Uh, so this method actually, as a, although in fact the result and the um, main research question was not contributing method, but as a result of that reflective conversation between empirical data and the existing method, we also contributed adaptive CCM as a systematic yet innovative method that can be used for revealing different perceptions that uh, different roles or different people, different groups may have about the same phenomena. Okay, so this is really about, was about the emergence of the method. Uh, so now I'm telling you that how this helped us to address our research question, to come up to our first objective, to understand how different stakeholders in agile development perceive barriers to effective knowledge sharing. And of course, this is inspiring because it says how it can be used uh, for other researchers in different domain having different research questions. And actually, I believe this is something which can be done in various settings and 
all types of field because uh, in all aspects of social science we have things that you know we may want to know how different experiences exist about the same thing and what are the implications of that so let me tell you how we work with this method and how it was empower us to address our research question so uh, first of all this method its main um, use was that it added a structure yet innovativeness to our results and it helped us to develop some new theoretical and practical implications that at the beginning interestingly we didn't really expect it to happen and it enabled us to explain how and why different uh, roles have different perspectives so it wasn't just what are their differences also why they are different in perceiving these things so the first thing was that the method enabled us to develop these um, diagrams. So it, of course, a little bit of artistic stuff touch was in that too. But um, this was through this uh, use of the method that these four diagrams emerge. And these four diagrams is basically like the brain, brain of how project manager is look, thinking about barriers, how like. Um, client is thinking about the barriers and the other four roles that they exist. Um, so for example, I walk you through one of them. Let's say project manager map. It's saying that project managers as roles, they think that they are seven types of barriers to effective knowledge sharing. And they think all of them, they are influencing that inhibit knowledge sharing. And also, for example, project managers think that project technology barriers also influence pro team perceptions barriers. So mm, each map is exactly the mindset of this role. Uh, and you see a number of numbers in that on each of the links. They may give you a little bit of sense of this is quantitative, but actually they are extremely qualitative. But the method enable us to create this quantitative touch, which actually added a structure to the findings and um, provided some implications that I'm going to discuss in the following slides. OK, uh, so a mm, big overview of what were the findings. First of all, we found that uh, all roles highlighted all the seven barriers. Those seven um, barriers construct, the, it was actually interesting that it says that mm, the all four roles, they saw that these barriers exist, this construct, except developers that they did not refer to one of them, but all the other four roles uh, explain that such things exist without us giving them, but they, through their, their interview statement, they refer to them. Another interesting story um, and implication that uh, emerged out of the data was that there was actually variation in how they placed importance uh, of the different constructs. So for example, project managers thought this construct was more important and so on. And another very interesting one, which really this one was something that we did not expect it to emerge out of the data was that although, for example, project managers refer to team capabilities, what they meant by team capability was very different by what clients talk about. And this is a very important um, and actually influential issue in projects because what they mean by team communication, team capability is something different. They may both say that we need more uh, strong teams, but what they mean is different. So they are really touching different aspects of team communication. Okay, the first, next, next one. The first um, one, uh, I explained that uh, just a little bit that all four roles explain majority of the construct except developer. And also it was interesting that user representative that they were clients, they, um, they talked more about existing linkage. So there were, um, there were a number of measures. One of them was density of the maps. So you can see that these numbers, although they were qualitative, but it allowed us to see how how dense they think about the issue. So for example, developers had less their map had less density, but user representative had more density. And it was quite interesting. In the paper, we have explained why, for example, in that context, um, this may happen. The next item, um, next slide, please. Yes. 
Next one was that um, there was variations in how roles emphasize barriers. So you remember we had at the center effective knowledge sharing and we had seven constructs around that. So for example, project managers, they, put, they say that the impact of project setting barriers is the worst thing. Basically, that can inhibit effective knowledge sharing more than anything else. Developers say project communication is the most important thing that is inhibiting effective knowledge sharing. Testers, project organization, and team capabilities barriers by um, user representative. And we have referred to the literature, for example, in explaining why this is happening, we reviewed the literature to basically um, argue for that, which is really beyond the discussion of this presentation. I'm going mainly to focus on the method. But um, this was quite interesting because it allowed us to see what means to one group is different to what means to other group. Next one, is, please. Yeah, and then the, uh, one of the last implications was that there was also variation in how each role uh, conceptualized and thought about different uh, barrier constructs. And it was quite... Um, important issue. For example, these team capabilities that I referred to that earlier. Um, for example, it was interesting that the user representatives were talking about the social skills of developers and they wanted to see more of it. They thought if the fact that they may not have that, it's not good for the project. But developers, they were saying, yes, they, their team capabilities, you know, they need some improvement, but they never talk about that. They said we may need more better technical skills. And although the interviewer was uh, confronting them with some of the things that user representative had said, they said, no, no, it was all about the technical skills. So that was very interesting. Or like, um, for example, project communication bar barriers. Developers were thinking that project communication is a barrier to effective knowledge sharing. But they were thinking that it is a barrier because the users do not check these things with the end user of the product properly. But user representative, they were saying that it's because the developers do not engage actively uh, with uh, end users, and this is happening. So you see, they all say the same thing, but actually what they say is different. And it means the actions that should be taken to uh, resolve those problems are also should be different, something which often in projects we overlook. Please, next one. Uh, for example, I give you like uh, just two quotes, one from project managers that you see the project manager is putting this focus on project setting. When you have a budget that is a small, every single meeting you go to is costing the project. So you have to balance how much time you spend talking to people versus how much time you spend getting things done. Project managers were really involved in making sure that uh, the project schedule is met. So they were thinking a lot about this project setting. But for example, when we come to um, user representative, they were seeing that they were saying team capability is an important issue. They were saying if you ask end users, in that case they were nurses, uh, they wouldn't give you any straight answer because they haven't any uh, they don't have any knowledge of software development and they will probably say yes that's right and afterwards when you do the testing they say oh that's not quite what we want so they were saying uh, through the rest of the interview that uh, it is the responsibility of the developers to make sure that um, they they engage end users so that uh, they do not say yes at the beginning and at the end they just change their mind please this one. okay so basically our the uh, idea was to come up, address the research question, and say that how these um, barriers were seen differently. But also through this method, we could go beyond what was our first intention. By aggregating all the four um, maps, uh, the result was coming up with a new theoretical model, theorizing. Is next. Theorizing on uh, what um, was uh, what are the barriers to effective knowledge sharing because also that was not such a thing. So as a result, for example, in this case, our paper uh, developed this conceptual model that conceptualized seven constructs of knowledge sharing barriers with 37 knowledge sharing specific barriers that can be used both in qualitative and quantitative 
research by you know, developing measurements based, of, based on each of these 37 barriers. Next one. Okay, so this was really uh, about um, how this helped us to do um, and develop something new and how it can be also helpful for other researchers in different fields, um, basically those who are interested to understand similarities and differences. Okay, so now I'm talking about how does it work, how you can use it practically. So uh, in the earlier slide, I put this um, figure that uh, the ACCM is primarily focusing on the analysis, which is really the main part of this sort of uh, methods. Um, so I'm walking you through each of the steps. The first one is creating and using a standard vocabularies. It starts by content analysis, and you may be familiar with content analysis. It's reading all the interview transcripts. Actually, it's interesting. It can be interview. It can be secondary data based on the topic that you are studying. Um, grouping frequently mentioned words together, developing an initial list of codes. Next item would be, um, actually this can happen in an iterative manner, to examine the emerging codes against the existing uh, frameworks that exist in the literature without necessarily expecting that um, these um, codes that they are emerged out of our data is going to exactly um, map those things. Being flexible, but also trying to do not uh, reinvent the wheel from the beginning. And then next one, again, reading all the transcripts, coding them based on the um, code scheme that was emerged in the previous one. Okay, the next uh, step would be processing data for uh, causal maps. Um, so we have this code, um, codes, a uh, coding scheme, and also the interview statement that they are coded. Next item would be to read all the interview statements and try to identify the cause and effect linkage. So for example, looking for items that when interviewee is referring to, um, for example, team capability was a, was a problem because of this, we did not have time to, or we did not really have time to spend on effective knowledge sharing. And then after these items, if then or because and so is identified, next uh, step would be to categorize the finding. And it's very important. If you remember these constructs of seven constructs, um, it's important to put our um, barriers that they are identified or any item that you are interested to study into categories and it's very good to put it in a theorized way. So for example in this case we use Levitt model which, talk, which talks about organizational change. So we use them, um, we try to look at our code and put those barriers that had emerged into barrier constructs that reflect some existing theory that exists. And then next item, it comes to the more visual stuff, is to construct the causal maps. So for example, we had identified the cause and, cause and effect relationship. Next item would be to link each of these cause that we had identified to the higher order categories that was identified in the previous step, and then put a link between these two in a more visual way. We did a lot of trial to make it very user friendly. So when someone look at our map, they like it. It's, we thought it should be beautiful and think it matters a lot. And for example, like one example is one of the um, quotes by um, project manager was, I think different cultures are very challenging for knowledge sharing. We had agile culture that might be different with others and universities are more bureaucratic and not agile. So for example, in this case, um, next one please, uh, you see different cultures was coded as a cause challenging for effective knowledge sharing was the effect that what we were looking for. So for example, we said agile versus non-agile cu cultures is a type of a cause that can inhibit knowledge sharing. And previously, in the previous step, it was categorized under, under project setting barriers. So next, please. Uh, so when we draw the causal mass, we established a link from project setting to effective knowledge sharing. Okay, and then, so now we have these maps. There is no 
numbers on them. The next step is to analyze the map. And this is um, a lot of our effort was basically in coming up with measures to do that. It existed in CCM, but really there was not clear. So it was just like a number of definitions, but without having any um, guidelines about how to do that. So for example, but anyhow, before doing the analysis, the first step was to showing these maps that they, we had constructed to the people who took part in the interviews to make sure that they are credible, they are trustworthy. Uh, so the second step was to analyze the structure of the maps, and that's where we uh, identified the um, measures at the level of map, construct, and between construct. Uh, for the level of map, there were two measures of density and comprehensiveness, for construct centrality, and for between construct reachability. And finally, the last step was to um, compare these maps, again, at these levels of Con map, construct, and between constructs. Okay, I walk you through that, don't worry. We go through each by one. So map level analysis. The first um, thing, there are two measures. One is comprehensiveness, one is density. Comprehensiveness is a lot about how multi-dimensional people think or different groups think about that phenomenon. So for example, users thought about seven constructs, that is exactly comprehensiveness. And all the groups, they refer to seven constructs, except developers who just refer to six. Um, and comprehensiveness, if a, um, something, uh, a map is comprehensive, it means that uh, the people who are, we are constructing the causal map for them, they have a good understand, not exactly good understanding, but they see different dimensions of that phenomenon. And we have something called density. Density is about, um, so we have seven constructs and we have a number of uh, links. Density, you, you may guess exactly, like it's an indicator that is calculated by dividing the number of the links to the number of constructs that they exist. Um, and high density maps, they mean that the people in that context know that uh, that's phenomenal well. So for example, the more they refer to different um, links, which would be more high density, means that they are aware of the relationship. And actually that might explain why user representatives refer to more, in this case, refer to more relationships compared to others, because effective knowledge sharing is something that is part, especially users, that they are clients, can suffer from that. So they tended to talk about more problems that they may exist and inhibit effective knowledge sharing. Next, please. So this was the level of the map. So for example, at the, for the project manager, you see comprehensiveness was seven, and density was the number of the labs, um, the linkage that exists, divided by um, eight. But I actually, we put this one too, but um, that was basically 3.38. And the next one, the next level of analysis is construct level analysis. Uh, before going through that, I want to just say that see, this research is qualitative, but a lot of numbers are quantitative, and I think this is interesting about the method, that it gives that sense of innovativeness to the project, and it adds some new insights that we may not have noticed earlier. So we have uh, centrality. Centrality is also another measure that it says how important in the mind of project manager or developer or client, how important is that construct? It doesn't say that how, which one is going to have the most important impact or negative impact on knowledge sharing, but it says how many times you know, they talk about that. That is centrality of that construct. And it's um, calculated by dividing the number of links that exist in the map um, to, um, actually, why sorry, that the number of direct linkage involving that construct to the old linkage that exists in the map. Uh, talking about centrality of that um, uh, construct for that. For example, for this one you see, um, and actually the numbers that you see for within each construct is the centrality. So for example, uh, project managers, um, when 
so we had to aggregate all of them. And let's say if um, eight project managers they were interviewed, I had to count how many times you know they referred to the relationship between let's say team diversity and different things, and how many linkage they were mentioned. So it's not like at the level of this map, at the level of all the data we had, all the data of like eight, um, let's say eight project managers, eight hours each of them they talk. So um, each of them they refer to a number of times that these linkages were established. So centrality means that, for example, in this one you see uh, team perceptions barriers was very central, central for project managers. And to some extent, for example, in the paper, we explained that because project managers were seeing a lot of these relationships and they were hearing a lot about, um, like project, um, product owner was talking about this and they were very much at a position that they were hearing a lot of these noises. So possibly that's why they were talking a lot about and putting a lot of emphasis on that. A very important one is uh, what we are really looking for is reachability. Reachability is saying that it um, is an indicator of the strengths between constructs. And that's exactly what we also wanted to answer. Uh, which construct has the highest negative impacts in this case on effective knowledge sharing? And reachability is calculated by the sum of the direct effects of one construct to another one, both direct and indirect. Um, and it explains which relationship is emphasized more by each role. Uh, and of course, it can have two directions, positive or negative. In this case, they were all negative because it was about barriers. So for example, one example is that, um, let's say, reachability between mm, team capabilities uh, yeah, in this case, like team cap capabilities and effective knowledge sharing. So you see um, it's 0 0.11. So it was saying that um, the effect of um, how many times, in fact, this relationship was emphasized. And not just this relationship. So for example, in terms of project technology, you would see this relationship, it's not that much. But it sounds like project technology is influencing effective knowledge sharing also by influencing team perceptions. So in order to identify what is the relationship, what is the reachability between project technology and effective knowledge sharing, we had to calculate the sum of both this and those relationships. And these were happening at the level of all the data we had for that role. So I mean, I can't say that, for, I can't sum up in front of you because we had to go back to all the data that we had. Okay, please, next one. Uh, okay, so as you see, we started, the beginning was that we started by not much understanding about the topic. The literature was, didn't tell us what are the differences and similarities between different roles. And also we started by a method which was not really, we, we thought it is very interesting, very interesting, but we didn't know how to do that. And we started by that, uh, and the method gave us this initial framework to think about maps, to think about, yes, we can un identify map uh, construct and between constructs. Please, next one. But because there were not any of them, we had to engage in a grounded understanding and a reflective conversation between empirical data and um, the method that we already had. And uh, as a result, um, the ACCM adapted existing guidelines that existed, examine map again at these three levels based on these uh, clarified guidelines. And also at the same time, it's very, very important because also in uh, CCM, it mentioned that in order to develop such implication, we need some artistic touch to be f remain flexible to the data during data collection and also during data analysis. I remember that I tried a lot to be um, flexible to find meaning in the data, and especially the last part of the findings that you see about how different roles em emphasize about different uh, constructs in a different way, and they meant differently. This wasn't at all the recommendation of CCM, but um, I think one thing which is very important in this type of study is try to find meaning in the data. 
as more and it's interesting that always even little bit of data nowadays there are lots of focus on big data but I found that in little data there are lots of meaning if we look for that uh, so yeah as you see this is uh, really the method that was um, used in this uh, research and please next one and the application of that again it added both structures and innovativeness to our uh, research to provide these um, findings Next one, please. And the implications of different things that we were from the beginning interested and also going beyond to theorize and come up with a theoretical framework on how, what are the barriers to effective knowledge sharing. Well, thank you very much. I hope it was useful for you. If you had um, any question, you, maybe you would like to go back to our study and have a look. I hope it would be useful or you can always send me an email uh, and I'm open to your questions. Thank you. Thanks.